Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome back to another episode of the Seven Shifts Restaurant Management and Growth Podcast. I'm your host, DJ, and today on the show we had Chef Jensen Cummings of Best Serve Creative. We had a great conversation about the current labor shortage in the hospitality industry and came away with some great tips and tactics for both employers as well as employees for navigating what's going on right now. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey Jensen, how's it going? Amazing. I'm so honored, so grateful to be here with you, DJ. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, uh, Why don't you tell our audience just a little bit more about uh, both your background and what Best Serve Creative does uh, for the hospitality industry? Yeah, I'm a a lifer. My story starts even before my story starts. I'm the uh, fifth consecutive generation of chef, restaurateur, hospitality pro. We, my family, we opened our first restaurant in 1900 in Little Falls, Minnesota called La Fond House. Yeah, great, great family there. Then great grandfather grandfather were barmen restaurateurs in san francisco and then three uncles own seven restaurants across the country uh, even my younger brother is in the industry he's uh he's into sushi out in california he actually does uh, sushi programs for two of my uncle's restaurants so it's it's in my blood 100 percent, and so nice. that family legacy super important something interesting i, I appreciate this topic because i now have two young sons and I asked myself the question some years back as I was getting burnt out in the kitchen and had to like step away, would I want my sons to be the sixth generation? And unfortunately, at that time, my answer was hell no. Yeah. Like, and, and we can touch on some of that. And I had to reflect on my own um, complacency and complicity in what had happened to the industry. And so now I'm fully committed with best served to build something different, to communicate in a different way so that my sons, I would be proud to bring them into this industry and to be the sixth generation. So that's kind of that personal foundation for me. Absolutely. Yeah. And today, um, you know, I really wanted to chat about what's been going on in the industry with hiring, Um, you know, on both sides of the equation, people, uh, restaurant workers don't want to go back to the industry. And, you know, that's making restaurants having a really tough time filling roles right now. And, you know, it's a little ironic for most of the pandemic was hard to get customers uh, in the door. And now people are kind of, you know, with the vaccines, they're ready to be dining out again, but there's not enough staff to service them. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's crazy to think about, you know, a year ago where we are now with that um, being in this position, but um, I don't think it was just the pandemic that, that kind of brought us to where we're at right now. Um, and I'd love your perspective, but what do you think was going on a little bit before that? Um, and why did this cause such a big, uh, you know, just, kind of exodus of hospitality workers who are just moving on to other things? Well, it, our industry has been exposed. The, the vulnerabilities have been exposed and they've been happening for a long time. The reality of the restaurant model, I'll touch on this a few different times. You'll hear me talk about the model, the model, the model, because we need to shift the model. The model of the restaurant hasn't actually shifted except for these incremental little changes of adding different textures and facades for over half a century. Right. And then very specifically, in my experience over the last 22 years in the industry has been that our we burned hot. Our model burned hot. We all of a sudden went from being the the pirates on the pirate ship a la Bourdain to like the cool kids. And we didn't exactly know how to handle that. And so the the business model fed that monster. And it, it really, it creates amazing opportunities. Absolutely. It brought people working and preparing your food, growing your food to the forefront. So tons of strengths. The yeah. business model became immensely stressed. And we see that playing out again and again, where now people are saying, that's not what I want. That's not a sustainable life. And that's not a sustainable business model. And it's hard because it's hard when you have to reflect on the fact that you came up in an industry this way and now people are saying that's not the way that you build a sustainable industry what are we going to do about that and it's hard because it's like saying your kid is ugly yeah i don't (laughs) nobody likes to hear that so we're going to talk about the business model aspect for sure it's been happening for a long time uh it was already written this has just accelerated that process along and the disruption is happening from outside the industry which is really hard and challenging from technology to a pandemic to regulations, these are all being thrust upon the industry. The reality is if we're thoughtful and actually honest, we should have been disrupting ourselves and putting ourselves in a position where it actually worked for the people 
that commit themselves to this life. And that's, that's our mission with Best Served is to amplify the worth and work of people who feed their community. The work part is challenging. The worth part, DJ, is unbelievably difficult to even address, let alone create solutions for, because we don't value ourselves enough. We don't value our work enough. We don't value our product enough. Yeah. And that shows, and that's what's being exposed. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that this kind of shone a light on a lot of things that was wrong in the industry. And, you know, you, you put it very well. Um, you know, what, what do you think needs to kind of change um, you know, I don't think it's that restaurant workers need to change anything about what they've been doing. I think it, it's the restaurants themselves. And like you said, the business model, what do you think needs to change um, from a restaurant uh, perspective um, to kind of get people back in it and get people excited about working in restaurants and, and want to become lifers like yourself? Um, yeah. Because I just don't think there's the tools in place right now or, or the opportunities are there um, to really make that something that is enticing for people. I agree. I, I'm going to work this problem a couple of ways uh, to bring the most value to your audience. And so I want to kind of finish with six specific red flags to avoid on both sides of the equation. It's very yeah. important for us to understand where the intersections of the relationship are for workers and employers. And when we understand where those are, we can actually address them. But if we're just entrenched in this is the issue of a worker and this is the issue of an employer and not understanding how those impact each other, well, then we're only going to have this, what side of the aisle are you on, right? So I want to go into that. But first, we need to lay some groundwork because we can't just fix these finite things and expect to have foundational fundamental shift, which is absolutely what we need. We need to build something new. And so we talk a lot about workplaces worth working. We need to build the identity of what your individual business is, what the business of your market is, and what the industry as a whole is. And so it has to be new. We can't keep just putting different colors of lipstick on the same pig and expecting that it's going to be something different, right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And I have been so guilty of that. So we have to shift that mindset first. We need to understand that we are in the relationship business. We talk about the people business a lot. Mm-hmm. That's, I'm a people person. What the hell does that mean? We're in the relationship business. And no relationship was ever built through a product. Not one. Not one relationship. Now, product, experiences, interests, tastes, these things create the space and the opportunity to have uh, like-minded people come together to form those relationships and restaurants and food, beverage, hospitality are absolutely that. So we need to understand that the product, and this is hard DJ for a chef. I had to reflect on the fact that the food doesn't actually matter. The food is just proof that you are who you say you are. Right. Right. So for us, it's like, you got to stop selling food and start telling stories at every single level. And that's what we really focus on in, in the future of what we're doing. And so one of the goals that we have to set, we have to set, almost unrealistic goals, DJ, to make any progress. We need to flip the 73% turnover rate to 75% employee retention and satisfaction. Yes. That, is a, that is an ultimate and foundational goal that I have for workplaces worth working. 75% employee retention and satisfaction. And everything we do to that has to map to that. That needs to be the one, number one priority of any business is that because you are in the relationship business, which is between people, not in the product business. So we need to be clear on that. The product just creates the opportunity for that to happen. Yep. And so we think about that as in an investment model. There's four buckets of investment that need to happen. Wages, benefits, culture, and education, right? And that's a whole nother show. I just want to lay the foundation for people. We'll talk about the hiring process specifically. Yep. And yep. if you're able to find meaningful thoughtful and sustainable ways to invest in that, then you can actually build a model that is equitable, profitable, and sustainable. So that is, that is foundational. And yeah. that was a lot. So DJ, I want to let you jump in and, and, and yeah. unpack yeah. any of that, or we can totally move on to specifically hiring process, but I had to let people know what foundation we have to build. Yeah. And I think um, just building that important foundation, um, like you mentioned, is, is super important. Um, and if you could maybe just touch on it just a little bit briefly, we don't have to get into each four of the pillars, but I think it's important sure. to understand, um, you know, just a quick uh, cliff notes on those four things before we can kind of get into those big red flags that, um, you know, people should be looking for right now. Yep. Wages, number one, people have yep. to get out of fight or flight mode. 
you can't be in this am I going to be able to survive because you can never put your best foot forward in any situation, personal or professional. So wages are important. One of the things that I tell people is like, don't romanticize the fact that you lived with four other people when you were coming up in the industry, making nine bucks an hour and eating top ramen and feeling lucky to put an egg on. I'm talking about myself right now. Right. You know, <laughs> uh, that's not what you're trying to build. Okay. And so living wage calculator, it's the number one thing I tell people, don't romanticize what you think somebody could get paid and be able to do well. Just because you made $9 an hour and they're asking for 16 doesn't mean that they're asking for something that is outside of the realm of what it takes for them to just be able to pay their bills. Yep. Living wage calculator has to happen. Everybody needs a living wage, full stop, period. No questions asked. Mm -hmm. Benefits, they need to, again, feel safe and secure. That sense of security is going to allow them to have a sense of belonging within their workplace. Super important. And one of the red flags specifically talks about benefits uh, because sometimes we're just saying we offer benefits and trying to do as little as possible as just this, uh, this bait and switch opportunity to like get people in the door. So you have to really invest in benefits and that's health, that's mental, physical and mental. That is the opportunity for, for getting uh, you know, phones paid for anything that helps pay for the life that you need to live very mm -hmm. simply sick days, things like that kind of feed into that paid time off. So that balance creates a little bit of balance. Uh, culture is absolutely important. We talk about culture a lot and the reality in restaurants is we invest so much in the culture for butts and seats, for yeah. our guest yeah. experience. And there's a negative balance in the culture investing. And just because we put on great experience for other people, we think that that somehow is a pass through for great culture internally. And the reality right. is we've all been guilty of perpetuating toxic culture. So we have to really invest in culture and then education, the last piece. And this I know it's important to you. I know you just wrote an article about this where we have to find ways to like improve ourselves, not just like here, I'm going to teach you how to do your job better so you can make more money for me. Here's something yeah. you can take with you that improves you as a person, as a skilled worker, or as an intellectual. So really thinking about education, which is different than training. So I want to make sure that those are the four pillars of investments. And DJ, what we nice. keep finding is if you take care of people in wages and benefits, and then all of a sudden you say, hey, we're going to invest more money. And there's clarity around that. Every quarter, people go, I'm good with my wages and benefits. I feel I'm good. Let's take yeah. care of the team. And they say, hey, the $10,000 you were going to invest, I don't want a dollar raise. I want that to get invested in culture education. That's when you start really building a dynamic team. Nice. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's great. And, I, you know, I wish you had more time to get into all those four, but I think. Um, we'll, we'll do another episode. We'll, we'll do another it. one. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll, um, you know, want to talk about kind of getting into that now and, and, you know, once you've laid that foundation or, or, you know, you're in the process of laying that foundation, you're fixing some things, you, you're starting new, you're, you know, reflecting, um, you know, when it comes to hiring and attracting good talent and keeping them and to the point where maybe you did have to furlough people because of the pandemic, but they're mm -hmm. itching to come back when you're ready to be able to have them. And when there's, uh, you know, there's guests there to serve, um, you know, what, what are those uh, six red flags um, that you're looking at uh, when it comes to the hiring? Yeah, hear, hearing you ask that question and speak on that, there's two little foundational things I want to lay out real quick. One is your vulnerability in this moment is not because people are on unemployment. I want to make sure that is crystal clear. If, if you are not able to get people to work because they are on unemployment, that is, that is not a reflection of them being lazy. That's a reflection on the fact that you don't have something to offer them yeah. that is more meaningful let alone valuable than them taking time for the first time ever in their careers to not be treated and exploited to the degree that we've done. So you have to really reflect on that. Restaurant people are the most hardworking, dedicated, selfless, totally wild and crazy people you will ever meet. And so the fact that we have built an industry on hard, hard work, there is no doubt, nobody can doubt that that is the reality of our industry to then now say that they're lazy because they were lazy or always lazy 
that is a reflection on the industry, on the business, not on those individuals. So I want to make sure that that's clear. The next part is you have to tell stories once again. So we talk about tell your best stories, which breaks into three parts. Your mission story, that's your North Star, your about story, that's what you tell your audience and reflects who you are and your job story. Three fundamental stories we need to tell. The job story is really focusing on, again, where do we intersect? What is the places that we can find common values and be able to build something together? And so the number one thing, DJ, that comes into that play is we have to start to hire for attributes and train for skills, right? Mm -hmm. Because what we do is if I ask anybody, and you know me, I ask hundreds and hundreds of questions and just get thousands and thousands of answers from people because we're asking real questions. I ask people, what, what do you hold in the highest regard for employees and coworkers, employers? Everything is attributes, that they're motivated, teachable, team player, hardworking, punctual attributes. I ask the same people, what do you base pay raises and promotions on? And it's commoditized skill, commoditized skill, commoditized skill. What ROI are they bringing for my business? It's like, oh, well, you must have open book management and allow your line level employees to know what the numbers are so that they can give you a clear and accurate representation of how they impact your numbers. And of course they say, no, we don't share those numbers with them. So how (laughs) would that person actually be able to tell you what the ROI of their struggle for your business is? It's a non-starter. It's, it's fake in its ability for us to create that. So we have to shift that mentality. And then we wonder why the number one paid person is the asshole that nobody wants to work with because they have the most skills and the least attributes, right? This plays out a lot. So more foundation. Now, if we have all that built, the six red flags to avoid, this is for both workers and for employers because it is the connective tissue. Number one, uninspired job posts. How many job posts do I have to look on on Facebook or Instagram or anywhere else that say hiring line cooks apply here? Like I've yeah. seen them that literally is like, I sign me up, DJ, that job is going to be the <laughs> one that creates the value and meaning that I've been missing in my life. That's the one. How many amazing workplaces say that it's just transactional. They're just yeah. trying to like upsell you into adding on bacon onto your burger. Like that's how little that they think of you in that moment. And good people are doing that because they're so busy. I just got to get a post up. Hey, hiring line cooks, hit me up. Uh, You know, that's not going to build a foundation. So those uninspired job posts have to go. Yeah. No more help wanted sign. Right now, now hiring. And then I see stuff like they say now hiring and say nothing, but the now hiring is in like neon lights. Like, wow, you have to tell a story. Why the hell should I come work for you? The reality of that is important because if we're saying we're putting in so little effort, so little time and thought into trying to hire you, at what point are we going to hold ourselves to esteem and to higher standards? Never, never. It starts at the beginning. So I want to really make sure that's important. Empty words, DJ, we use so many empty words that mean absolutely nothing in job posts, job descriptions. Come work at it. You want to work at an upscale, high volume neighborhood restaurant? Sure. (laughs) What the hell does that mean? I don't know what that means. What that means to me is you don't have clarity on on who you are and your message. You're understaffed. So it's always high volume. And you're basically trying to say, hey, you're going to be really, really busy. You Mm -hmm. know, things like that. Flexible schedule. What does that mean? Like responsible for all blah, blah, blah responsibilities. Like we just are copying and pasting so many things and then saying that this all of a sudden is like wow sign me up empty words we have to stop using empty words yeah and like you said i think you mentioned before you know the food doesn't matter um you know of course the food matters but i think in the sense of um you know a lot of places maybe it's a hot spot you know with dope food and they're they're putting up you know we're hiring and hope that someone sees like oh yeah that's a that's a great restaurant i should work there because they have good food but you're not talking about what it would actually mean to work there yeah Um, and I think that's you have to make it personal and unique. Yeah. Restaurants cannot be monolithic. Just because you've worked at a restaurant doesn't mean I know what I'm walking into potentially working at your restaurant. And that's again being exposed. So I think that's that's another thing. Empty words. Start saying things that are meaningful to you. If you're a neighborhood true. restaurant, hell yes. Tell me what neighborhood. We represent the Pearl Street district. We have been here 
representing this neighborhood for the last 12 years. That I'm inspired by. Yeah. Not your neighborhood restaurant. That just means you're trying to like keyword somebody and trick them into signing on the dotted line. Right. So empty words, got to go away. Pay. A lot of issues in pay. Obviously, we mentioned the wages, benefits, culture, education. You need to invest in those. But there's also a lot of deceptive ways that we're, saying, we're, we're using pay in the hiring process. And this number two. Like, what's that? This number two. Uh, number three. Number two is number empty three. words. Un- two is empty words. Uninspired hiring posts, empty words everywhere. Number yes. three, pay. Yes. And pay, you have to invest, like I mentioned. Yet you also have to recognize that we're using a lot of like deceptive language or ambiguous language. And you're going to hear a lot more of that. Clarity, clarity, clarity has to be at the forefront. And so things like competitive pay, pay based on experience, these ridiculously large pay range. And what keeps playing out is this just a way to try and pay to the lowest common denominator. And nobody's getting tricked by that anymore. Right. And so you have to understand the value of the job itself and then find the person who fits what you're trying to accomplish. Not that they have enough of the skills or experiences, hire for attributes, train for skills. We have to start having clarity around pay within the hiring process, not just the investment that we're making, but based on experience is just a way to say, oh, look at this 14 to $18 an hour. People go $18 an hour. That could change the way that I live. Right. Yet what we're trying to do is pay people 14 and then find excuses that their experience is not good enough to get them to the $18. So we're really big on just clarity on starting range pay. That's number three. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, ranges like that are deceptive. And um, I think just being upfront about it, you know, and it could be experience based, it could be merit based, but just, um, you know, that race to the bottom, I think it doesn't really benefit anybody because yeah, you might be paying people less, but you know, they're not living the best way they can. And then they're probably just going to leave in a month anyway. Um, yep, so yep. Absolutely. Uh, number four is the vagueness around benefits. You know, we, we, we talk about benefits a little bit because we've recognized that like, and even myself, I didn't know that benefits is something that you were supposed to have in a real career path yep. uh, for so long in my career. And we, we need to start to build that foundation for having that equity of you have a sustainable lifestyle that this is quote unquote a real job because the reality is it's not right now because Mm -hmm. real industries are investing in the success of their people and we are using the success of our people to invest in the success of our business and it's a little bit backwards so you got to be very clear on what the benefits are are you offering health dental vision are you offering paid time off? Are you are there sick days built in to your model? How are you actually making sure that people have that balance? Can you come up with creative things? We got an article coming out. Somebody just sent to us that just totally like blew my mind about in pet insurance. I was like, that's brilliant. Pet insurance is a little thing that so many people in the industry are deciding if they have enough money, three hundred dollars, to spend to get their dog dewormed or that for them to go on their yearly checkup and they're choosing their pets over yeah. themselves. And we have to understand that's a reality that we're creating. So vagueness of benefits is leading to people not knowing what the expectation is and we need to address it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And pet insurance is one of those little things that you might not even think of, like you said, that's, you know, it's not super expensive and it's, you know, just something to show that you care. And it just, it's something that sets you apart. You know, why would I leave and go across the street to the other restaurant? They, they help me take care of my dog, you know, yes. and, and it, me. It's the thoughtfulness of it. <laughs> yes. It's thoughtfulness and investment. It's balancing both. It's why and what and how. And, and I really appreciate any time those come about. Uh, totally. Interview expectations. There's a lot of ambiguity in that. What is the expectation? How many interview am I going through? Am I doing a working interview stage? Are you going to try and just get free labor out of me? Or is it very clear on what that expectation is? We have to understand that process and know that, you know, for some people getting down to your location is a challenge for some people working seven hours on a stage to see if it's quote unquote, a good fit is pure exploitation. And so we have to have clarity around that. If you set that expectation on the front end. Okay. The, the, The thing is like, come to a working interview. Let's see what you've got. 
and they're there for three hours. And the reality is if somebody's going through the hiring process, you're looking at multiple applicants. If somebody's going through the hiring process, they're looking at multiple employers. And all of a sudden, like we, this has happened many times. People are like, hey, I need to go get to my next stage. What else can we do to like lock down this stage? And then that person is automatically disqualified because all of a sudden our ego is her like, you're going to go do another stage? Yeah, you're going to interview other people, aren't you? Yet they didn't know they were walking into a five-hour stage where just randomly oh. you'll be set next to somebody who didn't even know you were going to be there that day. And that expectation, we have to build clarity around it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Interview expectations, number five. And, um, you know, let's round it out. What's that last big red flag? It's lack of clarity around onboarding and training. Okay. Right? We, talk, we talk about day one into the fire is something that we talk about. How yeah. often these scenarios play out of onboarding training. I want to lay this down because every restaurant person will know exactly what I'm talking about. You're hired. Awesome. You start on Monday. Go ahead and bring your, your passport, your ID, your social security card, all, all the things that you need. We're going to fill out paperwork. You're going to start at three. Why don't you come at two and finish that paperwork? Mm -hmm. Awesome. I come in at two, ready to rock. 159. I, I show up. I'm Man. there. I'm ready. Uh, they say, you know what? We had a crazy busy launch. We got to reset. Why don't we just get you going on training? And we'll worry about the paperwork later. You're going to be training with, with Susie. Susie has no idea that you are training with them. So you just follow them around awkwardly doing things. If you're yep. in front of house or back of house, end of that shift, two scenarios. That manager is a mid, so they left before the shift was open, over. So there's no, there's no filling out that paperwork. Then you say, they, the, Susie says, just bring your paperwork back tomorrow when you're supposed to start. Well, the next day, that manager is off. So now you go two, three, I've heard people not get their first paycheck because they're not even on payroll. They're right. scribbling their hours down, yeah. <laughs> right? And or they're getting cash in an envelope. That's exactly it. <laughs> and we have to have clarity about the onboarding and training process so that there's accountability from day one. Do you think that there's any chance that an employee that goes through that completely haphazard pro process is going to have an expectation of high standards. And then two weeks down the road, you're like, why aren't you doing your job properly? There's a recipe. You mean the recipe that's been scribbled over five, seven times that I was never actually trained on yet. Now you're going to hold me accountable for that. So clarity on the front end of understanding the onboarding training process is going to create that foundation. So this person has a real trajectory towards success. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's just quick recap six red flags. Number one, is yeah, so uninspired posting. Posts, number one. Number two, empty words everywhere. You have to have meaningful, specific words. Number three, we need to focus on the pay and make sure that there's clarity around pay and not use deceptive language to try and trick people into them paying them less. Number four, benefits. We need clarity around benefits. Number five, we need clarity around interview expectations. And number six, again, clarity. I'm a broken record, I know complete lack of clarity on onboarding and training is a huge vulnerability. Absolutely. Jensen, um, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on today. Um, and, you know, I think that's all we have the time for today, but we got a lot of great takeaways for folks in the industry. I think um, to be able to kind of get through this and, and look back and, and reflect and see, you know, maybe what they're not offering employees and, and what they can do to attract better talent and treat them better. Um, you know, and it'll benefit the restaurant in the end. Um, where can people find you? Uh, definitely besserpodcast.com, at besserpodcast on social, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. You can find us. We're getting a lot of the messages out there. And uh, just a, a call for everybody out there. We host content for you. I don't care if you're a dishwasher, if you're a line cook, if you're a server, if you're a bartender, if you own 10 restaurants. We are about bringing more voices to the conversation, what we call unsung hospitality heroes. So our blog page has on bestsellerpodcast.com articles from line cooks in New Hampshire or a, a chef in the middle of Missouri or a server in Denver, Colorado telling their truth. We're hosting the opportunity for them to share. So we're excited about that. So come find us. Your story matters. It truly, truly matters. And uh, my team and I, we want to share it. Absolutely. Yes, definitely check out what Jensen's doing. Um, he's out there every day, um, live, having conversations and, and really just, um, you know, keeping things going. Um, Jensen, thanks again. DJ, thanks for your leadership and bringing more communication to the forefront. I'm grateful. Thank you. Cheers.
Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Seven Shifts Restaurant Management and Growth Podcast. For more great content, you can check out our blog at sevenshifts.com slash blog. You can also find us on all social media platforms at Seven Shifts. Thanks again.